So thank you for having us here. Jim, can you hear us? I can. Awesome. So excited to have you. So what we're going to talk about is implementing CDEX, which stands for Clinical Data Exchange, to actually support multiple use cases. And we heard a little bit of that in, in the previous uh, discussion. So again, we've talked about DaVinci. So part of my role here will be to channel my friend, Viet Ninh, uh, who talks a lot about this. He's uh, part of the DaVinci project. And, you know, they're really on this journey to make value-based care easier. And there's so many pieces to value-based care, but we've talked about prior off, but clinical data exchange actually is so fundamental to improving the way we work together as payers and providers in support of our patients and our members that we can't sort of lose sight of that. My favorite slide, look at all the great work that has been done in terms of building out implementation guides to support all this. Now we've been sort of focused on um, the coverage, transparency, and burden reduction, but clinical data exchange is what we're gonna talk about here because it certainly is sort of part of the journey we hope on how to think about supporting uh, different use cases like attachments, like actually clinical documentation for quality measurement and for risk adjustment. And that's what Jim's gonna talk about when we get there. So I've stolen slides from DaVinci, they know this. Um, but you know, their message is why now? Why are things different in the industry? You know, and I think that, you know, the partners have all been working very hard in the DaVinci project to actually demonstrate that this works, that we can build implementation guides, that we can create reference implementations, and that we can actually make it work in practice. And that's really important because if we hadn't had that kind of success and had it more than an N of one, we wouldn't be here talking about it. Regulation has certainly been driving this. There's just this heavy, and although none of these are mandated in any of the roles, 9115, 0057, it is certainly listed, it is called out because they'd like some standardization. Barriers to exchanging clinical data is dropping. It is getting easier to do this. And actually Jim's gonna talk about how they envision that you know, fire and a fire-based clinical data transport will actually be a game changer for them. And then again, it's reducing our overall industry burden as we move to value-based care. So I think I showed this slide yesterday, but say it again, you know, they've been on their journey. Fire is the core of what they're doing. It's scalable, it's end-to-end. -end. It's not one-to-one, -one. it's many-to-many. -many. And you know, this says, it supports prior auth, but it supports prior auth, clinical data exchange, quality measures, risk adjustment. There are all these use cases that are all built on this same, I call it the tools and the toolkit. Um, to me, DaVinci is interesting. So when you go to cook something and you have a recipe, the recipe has ingredients and your job is to follow the recipe but you might vary a little bit as you go through, because everybody does. Nobody does it exactly the same way, but the goal is to kind of have everybody have the same cupcake, right, or the same pie. And so Da Vinci is creating what I call all the ingredients. And then they put together the different recipes with those ingredients that help you think about, how do I implement this? Then they give you an example, so they show you somebody who's actually cooked it. Um, but they also give you wiggle room to say, okay, when I'm working with this particular pair provider combination, it's gonna be a little different and we understand that. So let's give us that latitude. And you know, APIs have done wonderful things in other industries to improve the way we do business. We couldn't be transacting business the way we do if it hadn't been for modern APIs, web services. And so, you know, it's the right time and all of the data. What's the right data? How do we do deliver that payload into the right place? And we couldn't have survived COVID if we didn't have APIs. I mean, how many of you shopped online during COVID? Like all of us, you know, we weren't leaving our houses to go to Walmart because Walmart was probably closed. 
So it really is this journey that we're finally taking in the healthcare industry that other industries have figured out. And it's, you know, giving us the opportunity to have actionable data to start realizing that the data we have in our infrastructure isn't exactly perfect or lovely and that we're picking that up. But what you don't know, you can't fix. And, you know, it will start to reduce the maintenance and break fix that is inevitable when you put what I call brittle systems in place. So I love to talk about this right data, right time, right use case. So historically, if you look on sort of the left-hand side there, a pair systems are predicated on sort of best of breed systems, each doing their own thing. You've got your member management system, you have your claim system, you have your UM system, and they all talk to each other through a data warehouse or a data lake, right? That's how data gets exchanged in many pairs. But the nice thing is that, you know, if you've got this platform that brings in clinical data and all the other data sources and makes that available, I like to call it the ingest once, use many, right? Bring the data in once to your infrastructure and then use it for all these downstream purposes like prior authorization. Well, if you look on that sort of right-hand side, Right now, getting that data into anything is still not that easy. You know, HL7v2 uh, CCDAs sort of are still point to point. They're not using modern APIs. They are not talking to endpoints. And we still need to figure out sort of the directory problem. And that's what FAST is trying to do. And I think that's all sort of great work that still needs to be done. But we're moving in that direction. So for those of you who aren't familiar with clinical data exchange or CDAX, because I don't think I've seen anybody talk sort of specifically. So what it really is, it's connecting organizations and exchanging clinical data between referring providers, between providers and payers. It's requesting attachments to be able to support claim submission. It's also medical necessity support. Um, it's support for claims and prior authorizations that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. It supports digital signatures. So if you think about risk adjustment, you actually need those digital signatures in place to be able to show the authentication of a particular document. Um, so that's one of the things that you know Jim will talk about because that's really important to how they're trying to think about their strategy because they don't want this to be a one-off. They want this to be a holistic way of bringing in clinical data, the right clinical data, and then again, that use, sort of ingest once, use many. So I think that CDEX, and it wasn't called out in the 007, you know, either rule, yet we're hoping to see some change in that, perhaps, that that will become a new set of implementation guides because it has shown a lot of maturity. And even if it doesn't, I think a lot of pairs will pick this one up. When the Da Vinci folks sort of polled their membership uh, towards the end of uh, 2022, that there was hand raising that said, yes, we plan to do some work on CDEX. And again, you know, this is just saying, look, there's documents, there's reports, you know, there are all the provider information, and this is allowing it to be both directions. It's bi-directional. It's not a it could be a pull or it could be a push. There are two different types of implementations. And again, I think I've already said, you know, exchanging data between referring providers, getting the attachments, sending attachments, digital signatures, and then additional information for quality and risk adjustment. Um, and that's that 79% of members polled kind of said, yep, this, this is the year we're going to pick this implementation guide up and start looking at it. So, said this yesterday, what should we be aiming for? Good, clean, quality data, bi-directional data exchange, and workflow. We need all of those to make this work. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jim. And he's going to talk a lot about what they're doing at um, Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield and how they're thinking about 
CDAX and their vision and their planning. So Jim, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Just tell me when to move the slides. Okay, and I, it would be helpful if I could see the slides. Um, I'm looking at you at the moment. Yeah, here we go. So um, as I'm, I'm really glad to be with you all today, uh, even if it is only virtually, I love uh, Chicago and I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I'm sure you all are having fun in that beautiful city. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on uh, on uh, what we're doing uh, in the clinical data space and more specifically in the long longitudinal health record space uh, for our members. Um, just as background for this discussion, we acquired um, uh, InterSystems Health Share product about going on two years ago, and uh, this is a product that is a health information exchange. Uh, Tool. It's a longitudinal health record tool. Um, it is uh, a fire server. Um, it, it has any number of capabilities that allow us to leverage uh, the data once we put the data into the system. And um, and we're now on a journey to build out those longitudinal health records and then <clears throat> begin to leverage that data. So we started with. Uh, clinical data uh, in, ingestion, and uh, we will move on. We've, we've just initiated a project to bring our claims data into the longitudinal record and tie it to uh, the clinical data that we're ingesting, and then we will follow that up with social determinants data in, uh, in short order. Um, we, we um, as I mentioned, we, we, we began with uh, clinical data, and um, and uh, we, we partnered with Point Care Partners, uh, which is the Da Vinci program manager for uh, uh, for HL7 and for other HL7 accelerators, uh, about three years ago to develop our strategy around interoperability. And um, and then the last year, we initiated a, a program with them that we call the Provider Interoperability and Burden Reduction Program for early adopters. It's where we're partnering with some of our key uh, providers that are willing to be early adopters of Firebase Exchange in order to get Firebase Exchange in place, because we believe uh, very firmly that uh, that value-based care cannot scale without uh, uh, these um, Firebase uh, flows that are evident in uh, the events you work. Um, so uh, in terms of clinical data, we have a proactive clinical data acquisition uh, Strategy, and by that I mean we are uh, uh, we have a single uh, universal use case that we have defined. Uh, talk a little bit more about that later, but we um, use that single use case um, uh, to power all of our use cases once we bring the data in house, and because we're going after that data proactively at the close of every encounter for every member seen anywhere across the country then we have the data available to us to uh, address our use cases as these cases uh, come up. So if you think about something like data science, data science uh, is not really um, waiting on data uh, and, and it's not really an event that they have to say, okay, I need to go get data for this member. They need the data uh, in mass in order to do their work. And so uh, we believe this uh, more proactive uh, single use case strategy accounts for that. Um, it, it, that's really where the, the, the problem starts to arise here. And there are a lot of problems that we can talk about with Health Information Exchange. The previous presentation mentioned a number of them. I'm going to focus in on just a few here that are relevant to the CDEX work that we are doing. And, and what we have found is we have worked to ingest legacy data, CCDA data and ADT data for that matter is that it's simply not scalable for our purposes. Um, uh, it, it is largely because the, the data sender, or in our case, the provider, is defining that, that uh, data fee. And as a result, what we find is that um, we are developing transforms for every provider uh, EHR combination that we have and um, and those transforms are exceptionally uh, expensive and slow to account for. Um, you know, we can bring in a CCDA document as a provider could, 
and make good use of it at the point of care, right? Because you've got a patient in front of you or a member in front of you and you need to see a particular medical record and the document is right there on your screen and you can work with that. And that ingestion is not particularly difficult uh, or, or expensive. But when you need to power the rest of those use cases, you've got to parse the data off of that document. You've got to set up registry entries and so forth. And that takes a lot of time in the CDA world. It takes us between 150 and 200 hours, depending on the variability of that CCDA document um, and the quality of it, to get it fully ingested that initial time. Thereafter, we just they just run into our system, but but that initial effort is is uh, very extensive. And um, as a result, you can imagine, uh, I, I failed to say one thing about Arkansas that, that might be a little bit different than some other blues is that we are a single state uh, blue, but we have over 65% of our membership that resides outside the state of Arkansas. So we've got to engage with uh, potentially thousands of providers in order to uh, uh, um, acquire the clinical data that we need to power our, our uh, uh, internal use cases across that entire membership. And when you think about having uh, potentially hundreds or thousands of providers and they all may have their own unique CCDA document that they've defined, then the, the, the receipt of that, uh, you can just imagine having 10 new, never seen before uh, CDA documents that come in, 100 new that come in in a day, and, and these things take 150 to 200 hours to, uh, to work our way through, you quickly just can't make that happen. So we, we've decided that, I mean, what we found is that CDEX allows us to kind of turn that on its head. It allows the data receiver to define the, uh, the, the data that they are uh, seeking and thereby develop a single transform into their organization, which becomes immensely more scalable than the, the, uh, the, the, the current CCDA oriented exchange can, can ever be. Um, some additional considerations, uh, and, and I mentioned that we have a single use case. We think this is pretty important because, and, and we honestly think that uh, information blocking opens this opportunity up for us in ways that maybe we didn't have before information blocking. But many use cases, uh, the 10 or 12 use cases the payer might have with the provider, um, and, and really back the other direction potentially if providers start uh, leveraging the data that we have. Uh, all of those use cases take time to develop and take a lot of time to maintain on both sides of the fence. They create a tremendous amount of chatter, if you will, on the networks that we envision uh, going forward. So a lot of uh, transactions in order to develop those individual use cases when a single use case will serve uh, all of our um, internal uh, requirements. Um, and I'll talk just a little bit about that single use case in just a minute. One other thing that I think CDEX opens the door for, um, HEDIS is kind of a standout in terms of, of uh, challenging use cases because of the need for primary source verification um, uh, or DAV certification, et cetera, which is exceptionally challenging, exceptionally expensive, uh, very fragile uh, 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 environments to, to manage that. And, you know, CDA documents uh, have been a challenge for HEDIS, but uh, NCQA is all right with standard supplemental data, and standard supplemental data is really just a very structured feed from a provider system. Uh, and so we think that CDEX has the potential to help resolve that. The addition of digital signatures that um, Linda mentioned really can go to the uh, authenticity and integrity issues that that uh, NCQA needs to have us resolve. Um, so we think there's some real potential there, but all of our other use cases are fully accountable within uh, the CDEX exchange, regardless of the, of the digital signature uh, issue. So, so what's our approach uh, to this? As I mentioned, um, we have a, uh, a need for medical record at the close of every encounter for every member seen anywhere across the country. CDEX has a push capability that can uh, leverage a trigger. Most EHRs, frankly, don't have that trigger yet, so we're, we'll, you'll see how we kind of work around that uh, um, in, the, in the interim. 
but we basically get a complete summary care record uh, that includes longitudinal and encounter specific um, information. We we get that at the close of an encounter. That we started with a, a data set that was sufficient to account for prospective risk adjustment. We use that use case because in reconciling it with our other use cases, it really had the most data uh, um, uh, available that we needed in that use case. And, and then it covered uh, 95% of the other use cases. We tailored um, our use case around the edges to address uh, things, but effectively that risk adjustment use case uh, needs almost all the medical, all, all the clinical content in the medical record. It doesn't need things like advanced directives. It may not need things like uh, allergies and intolerances that, uh, in, in that case, other uh, um, uh, use cases do need. So, as I say, we've kind of tailored around the edges to account for that. Um, as I mentioned, we can power all of our use cases with a single feed, and that's hugely important. It makes our effort to transform this data, this incoming data, into our longitudinal records highly scalable. Um, we're, we are, Arkansas has made the decision to uh, release the IP capital that we've developed to support this CDEX use case. Uh, we're in discussions with uh, the association, with uh, uh, our friends at Cambia, who are leaders in uh, the, the, the uh, uh, fire interoperability space for sure. And, uh, and we're, what we're looking at is the potential to develop an Apache foundation like uh, entity, probably. Uh, Da Vinci is already largely there, uh, that can become the groomer, if you will, the maintainer of these open standard uh, code sets that we might be developing, that Cambia has developed a prioritization that others might contribute um, in similar ways for other uh, Da Vinci oriented use cases uh, known and to come. And then um, basically make these, um, these capabilities available to any and all that want to uh, to use them uh, in an open standards uh, way. We um, uh, we have um, developed our capabilities to allow for other payers to use them. Um, uh, and, um, and of course, they're, they're connected to any provider uh, as well. Um, the last thing that I think is really important about our strategy is that we work to make it reciprocal for the provider. So payers often come with their hand out to a provider and say, we need, we need, we need. And um, and we feel like it's it's essential that we say, and we want to uh, support you in what you need as well. And so things like standing up uh, the PDEX API, the Payer Data Exchange API, to make our data available to our providers are part of our provider interoperability and burden reduction program. Uh, CDEX is first for us uh, because we can take, take care of two things in this regard. We can address our burden, we can address provider chart chase burden. So that's reciprocal in and of itself, but PDEX comes next and basically we allow for providers to attach to our APIs and pick up uh, data that allows them to see a broader perspective on our members. And then uh, on down through the various uh, DaVinci um, use cases. So before I move on to the next slide, uh, any questions on any of that? Hearing none, um, Linda, if you want to advance the slide, I'll move on. So uh, please uh, pardon me for my um, these drawing skills. Uh, it's a really basic diagram, but it really is a simple uh, thing to envision. Um, the problem that we have with the CDEX strategy today is that if CDEX doesn't exist, the IDs are not available in any EHR that, I'm, that we're aware of. We worked with uh, market leaders and, um, and they don't have them yet. So how do we affect this need for um, a scalable solution uh, when that doesn't exist? And so what we have come up with, with the help of our friends at Point of Care Partners, uh, um, is this managed middleware solution. Um, it's an important, uh, it, it's in, in, important in that it is temporary because when CDEX is fully implemented in, um, you know, across EHRs. This managed middleware may likely become unnecessary, but we feel like there is a need for the foreseeable future for many years uh, to 
before all of the different EHRs have this capability fully in place. So we'll describe a little bit about what the managed middleware allows us to do in the absence of CDAC on the, uh, on the, in the EHRs. Um, the first thing that it allows us to do is it allows us to get to this a data receiver defined speed that is so critical to scaling. Um, I mentioned that it is a, a payer agnostic. Um, we, we will make it available to any payer that wants to participate. We have stood up a, um, an Azure uh, cloud hosted environment where uh, this middleware capability exists. And, um, and we have structured the middleware so that it is payer agnostic. Uh, and that other payers can join. We have a number of payers from Blues that have already expressed interest in participating with us, and we think that that will uh, that will continue to grow. Um, essentially, it on the on the provider side, it uh, for the lack of CDEX on the provider side, we we touch largely fire APIs, but some proprietary APIs in order to get the data set that we need to uh, address our uh, universal use case. Um, for example, with Epic, uh, we're connected um, in their um, test environments and there's some 41 APIs that we had to touch in order to get that data set that we need. That wouldn't be the case if CDEX were, were in fully in place uh, there. Um, but we do use Fire and, and proprietary APIs to pull this data into the managed middleware and then in that environment, we take uh, that data and we transform that data so there is a transformation that's required into a CDEX bundle and into a, uni um, uh, a single a unified feed that will come to uh, uh, Arkansas Blue Cross, regardless of whether we're talking about Epic or Meditech or uh, Veridime or whoever the EHR is. That transformation, another key element of this, and, and what makes this, uh, I think, particularly powerful and can really cut costs, you know, today, all of those transformations that occur in the marketplace are mostly happening over and over and over and over again between payer and provider. So uh, two payers get together and we're both dealing with the same provider and we need this particular data. And on our end, we're each developing the transforms to make that happen and multiply that out towards times how many providers and payers that we, are, we have in the industry today. So instead of doing that, what we're saying is let's develop that in this central uh, um, capability and, uh, and then all uh, parties can reuse that capability rather than uh, having to develop it uh, on their end. So again, uh, dramatically improving the scalability of this and the cost um, uh, effectiveness of this uh, capability. Um, it also handles things like payers and basic things like that. But that's essentially it. On our end or on any payers end or any data receivers end, if it's two providers, uh, we take that single transform feed, we ingest it into our data model, our longitudinal health record. In our case, in InterSystems, that could be whatever your, uh, your environment is. Um, and um, and then we go about uh, leveraging that data for our many uh, use cases. So, any, any questions about the, that before I move on to the different operating modes that we have for this capability? Jim, it's okay. I actually have a question for you that people might. Be. So, what are some examples of the Epic proprietary APIs that you can't get in a standard format? Uh, um, I'm the wrong person to ask, Linda, and I apologize for that. Um, our, our folks at Point of Care Partners are, uh, have done most of that uh, uh, work for us, and um, uh, I know that we have uh, about 90% of the APIs are accounted for with uh, standard FHIR API, and then we're having to touch a, a smaller percentage for some additional data that they haven't made available. One example could be, and, and, um, and I think I'm pretty accurate on this, uh, the legal authenticator. So for our risk adjustment use case, we need a, a, a provider signature and a legal authenticator of that uh, by a um, appropriate clinician. And that is not part of 
the USCDI as a V1, for example, which is what most of these entities are making available. So that that would very likely be an example. Yeah, that. that makes a lot of sense to support the signature uh, part of it. So thanks, thanks, Jim. Yeah, and you know that's different than the digital signature. Digital signature really adds a, 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 a wonderful opportunity here because legal authenticator uh, um, is has been in place for a long time in CDA world, but a digital signature comes in and it says, okay, now we know that through hashing that the the information that was shared has not been altered. And what and, and oh we also know that the sender is who they say they are and the receiver is who they say they are. So we're tackling data integrity, we're tackling the uh, uh, data authenticity issues there. And those are the key items that EDIS is looking for uh, in in the way that uh, our existing um, EDIS primary source verification requirements are, are addressed. So if we can get to digital signatures, which is part of the CDEX capability, then I think we've got a very uh, uh, meaningful path towards addressing HEDIS in a far less onerous, far less costly uh, environment. Okay, um, just quickly on those operating modes, uh, we have three modes. Again, this is really to, to make sure that we have things available for any payer that might want to use the capability. Um, the first one is the bulk fire for historical pull. Uh, in, in our case, we will tap the, the EHR and we'll pull two years worth of history uh, to populate our uh, longitudinal records. Um, you know, that's a discussion with the provider. Some providers are going to be okay with that. Other providers may not be okay with that. And so we, we, we'll just, we, we're crossing that bridge as we come to it. Um, in counter close, trigger push, this is what I just mentioned. We uh, will use as our primary use case, uh, something to close in the counter. So sort of a proactive approach to getting the clinical data and then more of a reactive approach, nothing wrong with it, but it's more reactive in, in nature, the query response, uh, kind of demand oriented approach where you, you recognize a need for data and then you go and get it as opposed to the data being available to you in that longitudinal record. This capability, all three of those use cases are developed and functioning in um, two of our EHRs that we have worked with uh, so far. That's uh, Epic and, uh, and and all scripts are now here. Okay, um, last slide, Linda. So what are the benefits? I think you probably could hear uh, those benefits in my voice, but you know, we started this journey because we felt like the existing um, capabilities in the marketplace uh, we're not sustainable from a cost perspective. We have some direct EHR exchange um, operational today, um, and we have avoided some direct EHR exchange because it is the costs are uh, to the moon, and um, and we don't feel like um, you know. I think our position, I think Cambia's position, is that there is a level of exchange that needs to happen between payer and provider for the benefit of our patients and our members. And we need to, we don't need to monetize that base level of exchange. And part of that is things like CDEX exchange. Part of that is things like uh, automated prior authorization exchange, gaps in care. These things that are fundamental flows in value-based care. We, of course, we have to support uh, the maintenance of those capabilities. But there are a lot of folks entering this space today that have uh, dollar signs in their eyes. And we think that this capability that we are promoting particularly as we talk uh, to uh, two of the uh, QHINs with about this work, that we have an opportunity to really uh, to get in front of that monetization and hold down these calls for all concerned. Um, the, the, the middleware really uh, uh, creates a situation where there is very minimal work required by provider organizations. There's some testing that will be required when we actually go to live data. There's some security considerations that we have to account for. For the most part, we've done this work in the background, uh, working with directly with the EHRs, and uh, and and so we're intentionally minimizing the effort required by provider organizations. We talked about the ability to scale this nationally across payers and providers. You know, that's not an easy thing for an Arkansas Blue Cross plan to do. But we uh, have begun the discussions at the association level, and begun. We've been in many discussions at the association level. They're very supportive. Multiple blues plans are engaged in our conversations. 
uh, including uh, Cambia. And we have now begun uh, in the last uh, month and a half having this discussion with those two Cubans that I mentioned earlier. So we think there's some real potential to get it scaled in a hurry, um, a relative hurry. Um, we can maximize use case potential with the single push feed, uh, like we've talked about over and over again, minimize network chatter. And I think this is an important issue, transaction costs. You think about, you know, many different use cases, that's going to drive a lot of transactions. And transactions is where somebody, you got to, they've got to cover their costs somewhere. And transactions may not be the, uh, the, you know, this might be a per member per year type of a fee. But underneath that, it, it's really considering the traffic the, that's on the network and what what, ha, what has to be accounted for to support that traffic. So the fewer transactions that we have flowing through, uh, in my mind, the, the, the less costly this could be for the industry. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned, there's a potential avenue for materially less costly and complex uh, EDIS exchange. Although, um, if there's anybody that wants to join me in that study, I would love to have you uh, uh, along because... Uh, um, I'm not an expert in that space. I'm just um, using logic at this point to, to think through that. That's all I have. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and as I say, um, if there are other payers in the room uh, that are interested, um, I will uh, leave my email and uh, be happy to discuss this with you because we truly intend it to be an open standards uh, solution. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, there are questions in the room. So there's some in the chat and there's a, a hand up in the room. Yeah, just to be sure, I'm reading this slide correctly. The managed middleware is a tool from point of care partners. Is that no, correct? and I apologize. It probably looks like that. So I guess the answer is yes and no. It is a capability that point of care and partners helped us uh, originally, we were going to develop that capability. We found that capability in the marketplace uh, from an entity that is deeply um, engaged in a lot of the Da Vinci work. The the, uh, the lead for that uh, company is um, has written a number of the Da Vinci IGs. He's responsible for uh, uh, the the um, existing CDA testing tool that they own C. Uh, has available on their website, so he's deeply knowledgeable in this space. Um, uh, his company is Drager, um, and uh, as I say, I, we need something in the interim to make that this CDEX thing happen and to get at least the payer side of the benefits out of that, um, uh, the single transform benefits out of that. But you know, in time, with CDEX fully implemented, the middleware likely becomes unnecessary. Okay. Uh, thank you. This was a very informative presentation. Can you talk a little bit more about the monetization of data from electronic health record systems or data brokers? Yeah, I, I don't want to, I won't name any uh, e EHRs, but I can tell you that we've talked to, um, you know, Arkansas is about a, a short of a 2 million person member uh, entity. And we had quotes from a single uh, EHR entity that would range in the it was in the range of $18 million annually for uh, this type of exchange. Now, it was more than clinical data exchange. It, it addressed uh, proprietary types of, of, of uh, prior authorization and gaps in care and things like that. But those are all things that we feel like uh, with the DaVinci IGs that um, we can work across payers to develop and contribute to this uh, um, uh, maybe DaVinci-like uh, Apache Foundation, uh, the Open Standards Foundation, um, and then all of us draw from that. Uh, then what's going to happen is we're, we're going to have to say, all right, now how is the flow of information going to be addressed? So if you think about PEPCA um, and what's coming there with the QHINs, the QHINs have an opportunity to monetize this also. Some of them may want to monetize it heavily. I, I don't know that they do, but some of them may. Others, in the one, at least one of the ones we're talking to, is definitely not intending to monetize it heavily. And we think because QHINs can't charge each other, that that gives us an opportunity to you know, align uh, with uh, QHINs that want to, you know, focus on the, the public good, so to speak, 
here for these base level exchanges in value-based care and then drive costs down um, for the others. Um, but there's no question that uh, today, you know, there's a, there's a significant variation in what EHRs will charge for these direct uh, connections. Um, I, I gave you the number that's on the high end and there's at least two of the top three EHRs that are in that range. And then you have uh, everything in between down to something that's in the range of probably two or three dollars per member per year. Um, and maybe that's, um, uh, you know, that's more affordable, but still not scalable because it's based on uh, uh, this old legacy CDX, CDH. Okay. Jim, we've got to wrap up here because uh, okay. we've got to move on with the agenda. But I want to thank you for the leadership and the sort of innovation that Arkansas has been driving with this process. And it's great to allow others to hear what you're doing because I'm hoping we'll be able to have more people jump on board with you. But thank you. Uh, Glad to be here. Thank everybody. you for the opportunity.